Good afternoon and welcome to this FIDERIS webinar on credit rating agencies. On the previous two webinars, we focused on asset classes that we believe are going to be badly affected by the COVID economic crisis or better, the economic crisis that will ensue the COVID health crisis. And in the second one, we focused on CLOs in particular and the type of litigations that we expect to emerge as the crisis unfolds and losses keep mounting. Now, we, today we focus on the specific angle of rating agencies and their role in the financial system. Uh, we're going to look at how ratings uh, play a very important role in the system and how rating agencies act on the several factors of pressure and conflicts of interest that might impact and affect the way they rate and inflate their ratings. We at FIDERS believe that this time around, as the crisis unfolds, we will likely see more litigation against rating agencies, in particular in Europe, where the regulation introduced after the last financial crisis allows specific actions against rating agencies for negligence or better, gross negligence. But we also expect regulators to have another go at uh, rating agencies as the actions they took after the last financial crisis don't seem to have yielded to much uh, impact on the issues that had emerged last time around. So I'll start by giving some examples of rating scandals, what I would like to define as rating scandals. The first one is the very much uh, current case of Wirecard. Now, Moody's rated this company investment grade or BAA3 at the end of August, 2019. In less than a year, the company, as we know, has become insolvent. Now, I don't know how many of you know, but a, a, a BAA3 rating implies a 600 times more risky um, type of default than a AAA rating. And in particular, over a one-year horizon, it implies a probability of default of 0.4%. How can this have happened? How can Moody's not have taken into account, in particular, the allegations of fraud that the FT had already published in January 2019? Could it be that the 150 million euros loan that Deutsche Bank had extended to Wirecard and subsequently sold to European CLOs had an impact on their actions and their um, inability to take action earlier in terms of downgrading the company, uh, because this could have impacted also the ratings of all the CLOs that the Moody's was also rating. This is an open and interesting question. The second example I'd like to give is the example of MF Global. Um, as some of you, most of you might recall, the company went down in 2011 on the back of a very large bet on the sovereign debt of European nations, including Ireland, Italy, Spain, Belgium, and Portugal. MF Global had taken a, a, a long position on the, on the debt of these nations for a total amount of $6 billion has the sovereign debt crisis unfolded and the bet kept going against them um, and the global went bankrupt and filed for chapter 11. In a matter of less than three weeks, the company went from BAA3 to insolvent. So uh, again, a very short-sighted type of view from movies. The third example of rating scandal I like to focus on is a structure finance one. And this is a product called CPDO that stands for constant proportion debt obligations. These were products that were very highly levered, about 15 times leverage in the specific example I mentioned here. It was rated AAA by S&P in November 2006 in a matter of two years. By April 2010, it went down to zero in value. S&P got, um, um, got sued by a group of Australian councils 
and they had invested in the product and got uh, found guilty by the judge who um, found her liable for damages in the region of 16 million Australian dollars at the time. In terms of overall litigations and fines against rating agencies, there are not many. Apart from the 2012 judgment against SP, I just mentioned, there were a couple of settlements after the last financial crisis, one against Moody's and SP uh, in relation to uh, SIVs in the United States, another one against SP in Australia for the rating of CDOs. In 2014, and then two fines, one by the DOJ in 2017, which also obtained a commitment from Moody's to comply with the set of uh, criteria of compliance and controls that the DOJ imposed on them all the way up to 2022. And then another fine in 2018, also against Moody's for internal control failures in relation to the rating of mortgage bank securities. So, very few fines and judgments against foreign agencies, uh, in part because of the very um, strict uh, and high criteria that need to be met in order to sue any agencies um, after the last financial crisis. I would like to just give you a few snippets of the judgment in the Australian case I mentioned earlier, the 2012 judgment by Judge Jagger. Uh, a federal judge in Australia who said that uh, in relation to CPDOs, SNP had been misleading and deceptive. They also said that no reasonably competent rating agency could have rated the product AAA, and that the issuance of his CPDO included statements that were false, in material particular, and involved negligent misrepresentation. Now, about $5 billion of CPDOs were issued overall, and these remains to date and probably forever after, given the statute of limitation, the only case where a rating agency has been found guilty for negligence. The test for negligence in England and in the US is much higher. And um, also, as I said, it's very hard, it was very hard for investors to uh, sue rating agencies as they had no fiduciary duties vis-a-vis -vis investors as a contractual relationship was between uh, the rating agency and the arrangers of structural finance products. Now, the reason why in Australia this has been possible seems to have to do with a statutory prohibition against corporate um, engaging in misleading or deceptive conduct. It's a special provision they have in Australia, which seems to be absent in England and in the US. Now, going forward from here, where does Fideres expect uh, potential litigation areas to emerge? And here I just mentioned three of the possible ones. The first one is in relation to rating agencies' um, incorporation in their assumptions or lack of incorporation in their assumption of covenant life loans, which now form approximately 80% of all uh, um, loans in uh, CLOs. How did they take into account and not take into account these lower credit standards for these loans when they rated these CLO deals? The second question is about flip clauses. Flip clauses that are uh, clauses in swap transactions between uh, investment banks and structured finance issuers, special purpose vehicles. And they state that if uh, um, the company, the, the, the bank, um, becomes insolvent, then the, 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 the SPV ranks senior to all other creditors. And these, as we've seen in the case of Lehman, had a big impact on recovery for all other bondholders and creditors of Lehman. So how did post-Lehman rating agencies take into account this type of flip clauses when rating financial institutions? Um, we believe that there are still very strong shortcomings in the way the rating agencies do not incorporate these kind of issues, especially when it comes to European CLOs and European financial institutions. 
The third reason uh, we think there could be litigation against certain agencies is in relation to what we call combination securities. These are securities that combine a junior equity unrated tranche of a CLO with a senior tranche of a CLO. And the principal ranks uh, um, in line with the senior tranche of the CLO and the coupon payments in line with the junior tranche of the CLO. Now, given that the equity in the CLO deals is unrated, what rating agencies do to rate these combination securities is to rate them only in relation to the repayment of principal. So basically, they are like, assigned ratings which are in line with the rating of the senior tranche of the CLO. This is clearly a regulatory arbitrage which allows insurance companies, especially investors in Japan, to purchase securities um, i.e. investment in CLO equity tranches that would not otherwise be able to invest if they don't have an investment grade rating. So why do they still engage in these practices? I would like to move on now to, in particular again, to CLO rating issues. We um, have gone back and looked at the number of times that Standard & Poor's and Fitch changed their rating criteria for CLOs. In particular, Standard & Poor's changed them twice since 2016, once in August 2016, once in June 2019. On both occasions, they lowered the standards for the rating and that improved the rating of certain tranches of CLO. And these allowed SMP to increase its market share in the market for ratings of CLO transactions, as you can see from this chart, both in terms of number of deals rated and in terms of notional amount of deals rated, and both after 180 days and 360 days after the changes we have been implemented, we have observed a substantial increase in SMP's market share. Equally, Fitch changed the rating criteria for CLOs in February 2019. 18 apologies, and guess what happened? And in, this change led to an increase in future ratings market share in the market for CLO. And as a result of all these changes, we see fluctuating market share between the three major rating agencies, Moody's, SSP, and Fetch, that are in line with the changes in uh, rating methodologies. Now, ratings are quite vulnerable, as I said, for a number of reasons. But in particular in this chart, I'm trying to show that rating agencies are subject to at least four types of pressure factors. One is internal, and that is the top right of this chart, the uh, search for growth in revenues that are underpinning the continuous growth since the last financial crisis in uh, uh, rating agency stock prices. The second one uh, is type of, in terms of types of factors of pressure is external pressure. And this can come from three sources. Arrangers of such a finance deals who are seeking higher ratings uh, in order to place easier, easier placement of the bonds. From issuers who see the, in terms of, for example, corporate ratings, who see their ratings driving their borrowing costs and also uh, by investors. Now, why would investors in ratings want to put pressure on, on rating agencies um, and their decision-making process? Simply because investors, all categories of investor banks, asset managers, insurance companies, and even central banks through their quantitative easing programs have uh, entrenched in the regulations the need for certain minimum levels of ratings. And even clearing houses, in this example, I mentioned the CFTCs, have in included in the margining rules for unclear swap the need for certain minimum ratings in order for the collateral for such margin calls to be eligible. Now, as I said, um, regulation has been brought in in the EU and the US since the last financial crisis, a couple of uh, pieces of regulation in Europe and regulation number 462 of 2013 and the directive of 2013, and uh, Dodd Frank and the Credit Rating Agency Reform Act of 2006 in the US. I would conclude saying that um, both in the, Euro in the European Union and the US, these pieces of um, 
um, regulation have had very limited, if no impact whatsoever on the five key issues that rating agencies still face today. That is reliance of the financial sector on rating, as I just explained, all categories of investors still rely very heavily on rating, very little competition in between rating agencies. Uh, rating agencies has broadly been kept unaccountable for their action. In Europe, slightly less because now investors have a right of action, private action against rating agencies, but just for gross negligence, which is a very high standard to meet. In the US, not even that. Uh, and so it's incredibly high uh, to pursue claims against rating agencies. And also in terms of independency, uh, the fact that issuers still pay for ratings makes the rating agency very susceptible to manipulation by issuers. Ratings are also being easily arbitraged by arrangers who shop around for the rating agency that can provide the highest rating for a set transaction. So on all these accounts, uh, the impact, as I said, has been negligible or not. And therefore, I'd like to conclude with this slide, uh, which I called a model proposal. A lot of the problems I mentioned on the previous slide, whether we're talking about rating agency accountability or independency, um, could be solved by having bondholders pick the right rating agency, picking a rating agency with a certain um, um, uh, rotation among the uh, rating agencies, by allowing uh, bondholders to uh, pick the rating agency, the rating agency will be accountable to bondholders, to the creditors instead of the uh, issuer. Uh, also, by making um, bondholders pay for rating costs, uh, they would uh, have to pay costs which are quite minimal. So taking into account a specific, a specific example of corporate bonds and corporate ratings, uh, this would equate uh, at a cost of $300 for every 5 million transactions, which is very minimal as a percentage of the transaction size. Alternatively, financial regulators could also levy a charge on the financial sector uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and appoint uh, rating agencies also on some sort of rotation. Um, and uh, by doing this, we, we would uh, districate rating agencies from the pressures exercised by issuers and arrangers. Now, I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, Bill Harrington. Bill is a fellow at the Creighton Institute, and I like to refer to him as a ratings activist. Uh, Bill was senior VP at Moody's. Um, he resigned from his position in 2011. And since then, through his writings and interventions, he has exposed some of the biggest flaws of credit ratings. And is today's focus on how to bring change to the current system. Bill will share his perspective on some of the issues I've raised in my presentation. Over to you, Bill. Thank you, Alberto. Um, and good morning to everybody uh, today. My name is Bill Harrington, and I'm a senior fellow at Croatan Institute. Croatan Institute is based in North Carolina, although we have fellows uh, around the US and in Europe. And we develop practical solutions to sustainability issues in a, in a variety of areas. My colleagues work on racial equity in the uh, business world. They work on place development via organic farming um, as a way of developing communities throughout the US. And my work is on sustaining the financial system itself. It began by trying to avoid the mistakes of the 2008 financial crisis. And from there, seeing how much of what should have been fixed after 2008 instead continues to perpetuate and undermine the whole economy. This is a particular concern right now as economies are already have been weakened badly by the COVID virus. And in one area, in the largest markets in the world, the debt markets, the credit rating agencies play an entirely harmful and noxious role. And the credit ratings simply looking forward will not help our economies make the investment decisions that need to be made 
with the more limited resources that we'll have going forward in order to make the economies and societies work as well as possible. Alberto had a, a reasonable proposal for how to improve the credit rating regime. And because the credit rating regime is so bad, I welcome all proposals to fix it. But I would go much further. In the US, I would entirely abolish the SEC oversight of credit rating agencies. The scheme is called a Nationally Registered Statistical Rating Organization, or NRSRO. But rather than oversee these credit rating companies, at the SEC abets them to continue inflating ratings in all sectors. The structured finance might be the worst, but there is not a debt sector where the big credit rating agencies do not inflate ratings. And so I would say abolish the official sanction of ratings entirely so that at least there's not a pretense that there's oversight and someone trying to make sure that the system works better. A little bit about my background, as Alberto said, I was a senior vice president in the derivatives group in Moody's Investor Service. I worked in that group from 1999 to 2010. I published copiously, including on the flip clause. My work, my published Moody's work, stands up today. Most other NRSRO rate work on derivatives, flip clauses, and structured finance continues to fail. I resigned from Moody's in 2010 because the company was quite simply not trying to fix ratings after the financial crisis. Uh, I walked out the door without a, any sort of compensation or, dis or limit on my ability to speak. And since 2010, I have placed all of my insights, all of my critiques, all of my regulatory submissions, and all of my other work on credit rating agencies, on derivative contracts, and on structured finance in the public domain. All of it is available uh, either on my Croatan Institute bio page, that's croatininstitute.org, or on my LinkedIn page. And I welcome people to link in with me. I use LinkedIn primarily as a publishing tool. Prior to Moody's, I worked as a structure of exotic derivative contracts at Merrill Lynch. I worked on and on the FX trading desk. And the international uh, markets have always been a, a, a big interest and, and focus of my work. Prior to Merrill Lynch, I got an MBA at the Wharton School. Prior to that, I worked as an international economist at Wharton Econometrics, assessing the currency and interest rate markets. And I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, one other feature that's useful here, I worked as a uh, reporter for DebtWire ABS in 2015 and 2016. I resigned after the presidential elections because I understood that if I stayed at DebtWire, my job would be to report on the dilution of Dodd-Frank protections. Instead, I wanted to return to my advocacy to protect them. Um, and currently, my work focuses on the flip clause. I have a, a the first person to submit a petition to the CFTC to issue rulemaking. It's called a Section 13.1. And my rulemaking is, proposed rulemaking is to banish the flip clause. This can only be done in the US. It was a major part of the financial crisis. It's entirely under assessed, if not, entire, if not absent from the, from the official history of the financial crisis. I'm extremely glad that Alberto raised it here tends to be one of the deep, dark secrets that people in structured finance know about but will not talk about publicly. There's some good news, bad news for the listeners. If you're in the US, the good news is our US swap margin rules, which are stellar as they're currently constituted, prevent the flip clause from being used in the, um, US transactions. Although even so, and this is interesting, U.S. CLOs, about 80% of the outstanding U.S. CLOs still put a flip clause in their priorities of payments. They can't execute them right now owing to the swap margin rules, but they are through structured, the Structured Finance Association and other trade groups lobbying to have an exemption for structured finance issuers from the U.S. swap margin rules so that they can begin using the flip clause again. Um, in the rating world, I would think this is a make should be, if ratings were honest, a major knock on the governance of these CLOs. 
and a big feature of the credit rating agencies now is that they are moving in in name but not practice to the ESG space as well, um, both by developing ESG products and by acquiring ESG firms. Governance is a major part of their assessment according to the rating agencies themselves. Very difficult for me to see how they could not give a better governance score to a CLO issuer that omits a flip clause from their uh, priority of payments than one who includes it. The bad news is for Europe is your entire structured finance market depends on the flip clause. This was a policy decision uh, that the EU officials made in the aftermath of the financial crisis. They decided to define the origins of the financial crisis narrowly to, this, to that of the US subprime market rather than looking at the deal structures themselves that allow the same types of problems to exist in student loan ABS in the US and other structured finance uh, issues. And the flip clause is a way of pretending that nobody has to pay uh, termination payments when a, when a major counterparty defaults as Lehman did. 10 years later, there is still uh, litigation for Lehman flip clauses involving 50 CDOs and 150 other entities and 40 US law firms. In Europe, I, prior to COVID, I would have said there was some consistent rationale for using swaps with flip clauses because in Europe, you expect to periodically bail out entities, including financial firms. In the US, we decided something different, although now with COVID, everything is being bailed out and, and those waters are being muddied again. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to some of the work that I've done. Uh, here's as I said, most of this work is available and much more of it on, on my LinkedIn or Croatian Institute website. The first, the uh, Federal Reserve trashes Dodd-Frank restrictions on credit ratings. This goes to a point that Alberto raised earlier, that what's the problem with credit rating agents, with credit ratings, even if they're inflated, isn't the buyer aware? And the answer is potentially, but the whole economy suffers when they are used officially and embedded into uh, policy. And that is a decision that the Fed did not have to make, but did make with its uh, pandemic uh, recovery efforts. It is using explicitly NRSRO credit ratings as one limitation on what assets will qualify for uh, Federal Reserve lending programs. This is a major mistake. The Federal Reserve and the, its biggest vendor in the recovery programs, BlackRock, are perfectly capable of assessing credit without hiding behind the credit rating of demonstrably flawed credit ratings of the uh, NRS or our credit rating agencies. The second bullet re relates to my ESG work. I, I wrote it, this is publicly available on the Responsible uh, Investor website. It's how bond investors can emulate shareholder activism to, to try and improve financing for climate uh, projects. Unlike the equity world where uh, every equity owner is an owner in the company and go to shareholder meetings, and that is a real limitation which can have progress over time. In the bond world, the credit rating agencies are the main limitation. We basically have four or five credit rating agencies that rate most debt around the world. They now say that they take into account ESG factors. And what I advocate is that investors and issuers and other interested parties submit methodology critiques to the credit rating agencies to say, start walking your big ESG talk. We've read your methodology in any sector, it could be municipal, structured finance, banking, and we don't see where the ESG concerns that impact credit are showing up. And a very obvious critique would be even long-term ratings, which ostensibly can go 30 or 40 or 50 years, only have a three or five year evaluation horizon under the credit rating methodologies and credit rating agencies are explicit about this. But that means that for instance, in the US, if you had two municipal issuers, both of whom face extreme climate risk, such as fires in California, one of whom is doing something and one of whom is doing not is not doing anything. The ratings might not reflect the real credit risk that the 
municipality which is not preparing for more fires incurs. And the out that credit rating agencies have is that they can say, well, we do three to five year assessment and this risk might be further out. A, very, a way to change this is not by having private conversation with the credit, your favorite credit analysts. It's to engage in a detailed uh, campaign to critique the methodologies, which the rating agencies are then obliged to post on their website, and then use this as a basis to challenge the credit rating agencies in other areas. The uh, the third is my one of my CFTC comments to the uh, one of my comments to the CFTC. The CFTC is the uh, U.S. Commodities Futures Trading Commission, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which is the main de regulator of derivatives in the U.S. And it is to the CFTC has issued a um, a climate subcommittee, which is an achievement under a Republican-dominated commission, and, and so. And they're looking for comments on what type of areas in, in complex finance might be improved to address climate. And so my comment to the CFTC is echoes the one that I, I made um, with respect to a responsible investor. The uh, fourth bullet is my working paper for Croatian Institute, Can Green Bonds Flourish in a Complex Finance Brownfield? And it proposes a new sustainability score for financial sustainability. Rather than the top-heavy inflated AAA, I propose a scheme of rating products on their potential toxicity to financial sustainability. Minus 10 is the worst score, plus 10 is the best. And the point is not to be overly specific or artificially specific, but to really identify products such as the flip clause swap, which do only harm and no good. The fifth uh, uh, bullet is my petition to the, to the CFTC, my section 13.1 petition to ban the flip clause. And um, my sixth is a something, uh, a real point of pride. In 2019, uh, last year, excuse me, I spent eight months writing a motion to file a proposed amicus curiae brief and the proposed amicus curiae brief to the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit the, the case is the Lehman flip clause case that I mentioned. I am not an attorney, so I had to teach myself how to do this. If you were to pull up the docket, it's uh, U.S. Court of Appeals to the Second Circuit, 18-1079, you'll see that 15 of the last 20 docket items pertain to uh, my motion and amicus curiae brief. The motion itself presents my bona fides both to the court and to anybody who would care to read it. Um, in, my 20 year history of evaluating the flip clause swap and then from there, the regulations for derivative contracts and NRSROs. This is something that I am the only person in the world has done. Um, and I continue to push academicians and jurists and regulators and uh, law scholars to simply read the priority of payments in a structured finance deal to look at the flip clause and just on the face of it, see how this can't possibly work either in law or in common sense or in capitalization. Uh, I think the slides that Alberto has developed are, are outstanding actually and I'd like to return to some of those. So Alberto, if, if you wouldn't mind, would you please go to your first slide on Wirecard? I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. I think it's all the way back. It might be number two. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. Um, this the, the situation that Alberta laid out with respect to Wirecard is even worse, in my view. Uh, if you look into the second to last prong, 19 June 2020, Moody's downgraded Wirecard and they left the rating on negative watch. And then three days later, they resolved the watch, apparently, by taking it off watch and then withdrawing the rating. It, it sh this is worse practice in on every possible score. What the rating agencies are supposed to do before they withdraw a rating is move the rating to their best possible estimate of where it should be. There, there is no way that on June 22nd, Moody's had better information about Wirecard than it did when it put it on watch on June 19th. And what Moody should have done is at least downgraded the rating to CAA1 
or CAA2 or CAA3 or CA before withdrawing the rating. Instead, they, they just stripped off the watch and withdrew the rating. It shows, regardless of the reason, Alberto posited one and I'll posit it another, that the rating migrations are just as flawed as the initial rating because the credit rating agencies determine when and how and to what extent they might downgrade a rating. They have a strong incentive to limit downgrades until they're unavoidable because, and this is an, another potential reason for Moody's not having downgraded the rating before withdrawing it, is to make their own transition matrices, which they must report, look better. It is a terrible fact to have a below investment grade rating, excuse me, an investment grade rating, BAA3, end up in bankruptcy um, just a few days later. So it may well be that it's a combination of the two. The, the, I see so little good practice at the credit rating agencies. You may not have to choose the incentives for Moody's. They might have wanted to prop up the CLOs a little bit. You'd have to look through the rating definition in each CLO. Sometimes they reference the last available public rating as a starting point and then notch from there. And if that's the case in some deals, then the CLO's ratings themselves was an incentive for Moody's to act as they did. But I also think pure embarrassment is, is another reason uh, that Moody's did what they did. Okay, Alberto, can we move to the next DMF Global slide, please? The MF Global is not only a problem with Moody's ratings, but also S&P. And I can speak firsthand at this because in 2012, when the House Committee for Permanent Investigations was investigating MF Global, I cold called them. This is what I said. The, the head of the committee was Randy Neugebauer, who is a very known, well-known, deeply conservative legislator from Texas. And I called up his office and said, hi, my name is Bill Harrington. I'm a gay liberal Democrat from Massachusetts. I now live in New York. I'm sure there's a lot that your congressman doesn't like about me, and there's a lot that I don't like about him. But I think this MF global issue is a debacle, and I can help with respect to evaluating the rating problems with it. And to the credit of their office, they put me in contact with the lead staffer on the investigation, who immediately provided me with the Moody's and S&P committee memos on MF Global so that I could propose questions for the committee to ask. At the end of the process, the uh, committee asked me to come down and review the rating portion of the, um, of the, of the final report. The committee memos showed that the, neither S&P nor Moody's could even properly evaluate a tiny company because in finance, MF Global is a tiny company with a $1 billion capital base and $6 billion in exposures that Alberto mentioned. Even if, as expected, these um, European sovereigns weren't going to default, MF Global had mark-to-market responsibilities. And you just had to look and say, wait a minute, $1 billion capital against $6 billion of notional exposure. If these total rate of return swaps lose about 12 points on a mark-to-market basis, MF Global has to put up all of its capital simply to meet margin calls. How can this be an ongoing entity? How can this, even worse, if you look through the committee memos, how is this MF Global rated low investment grade supposed to be, according to the joint Corazine model, a mini Goldman Sachs? It, it, the malfeasance there was immense, but the bigger issue today is that the credit rating agencies can't evaluate the behemoth derivative companies like JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs. They can't evaluate or choose not to evaluate specific derivative exposures such as the flip clause swap. They don't even know about derivative contracts. This is just, um, it's like having a car and an engine and no drive uh, train between the two. There is no connection between the ratings that any of the NRSRO credit ratings assigned to any derivatives exposure and the actual derivative exposure itself. Um, okay, uh, can you go to the next slide, please, Alberta? Okay, the, the C, CPDO is such, such a bad fact. I was, it was one of the many things I avoided at Moody's, which is one of the many reasons I was able to 
be very proud of citing my Moody's work for the last 10 years as I continue to do, pursue my advocacy. Uh, the next one, please, Alberto. The next slide, please. Right, here, this again is an area that I was first uh, person involvement. In looking at the fine that the DOJ and the US state HEs imposed on Moody's in 2017, I worked with those state attorney generals since 2013, again on a volunteer basis, um, to explain how the ratings work for structured finance, talk about the flip clause and other, and, and other well-known problems such as those with CDOs. And, and I continued to meet with the uh, state AGs, including a meeting with all of them um, in 2016. Uh, and on the morning of January 13, 2017, after, as soon as the uh, announcement was made by the DOJ, one of the state attorney general called me to let me know about it and to thank me again for my help. And another state attorney general, which is one of the lead AGs, explained to me why it was so important based on the work that I and others helped them with to make sure that Moody's actually copped to having uh, essentially lied about its ratings and, and also make sure, have this compliance commitment, which is actually very powerful. Uh, if just Google US DOJ Moody's 2017 and you'll get the term, you'll get the term sheet as well as all the signatories and as well as the compliance commitment. Moody's has to report to each of the 20 states, the D uh, District of Columbia and the DOJ on a, on a range of ways in which it rates consistently within each asset class. And I think it's probably pretty easy to find that, Mo that Moody's favors some issuers over others. And it's also very easy to show that Moody's doesn't use its methodology as it says it does when it's assigning ratings and monitoring them. That sounds picky Yoon is actually very powerful. The, as, as Alberto said, it's very difficult to sue the rating agencies and the SEC does everything it can to avoid sanctioning them. But there is one area that the rating agencies are vulnerable. And that is that to to continue to claim their First Amendment protection as journalists, which they most certainly are not. The rating agencies say that our rating methodologies are public, our rating announcements are public, and we rate in accordance with our methodologies. That is a tenuous uh, representation, as my work over the last 10 years has shown copiously. A student loan ABS is another area where you can show very clearly that the rating agencies do not rate in accordance with their methodologies. But that's a critique that has outsized um, resonance with the rating agencies and the SEC and potentially other regulators and maybe the courts as well. And the advantage to people on the call is anybody can read the credit rating methodologies. It might be slightly easier for me to do so because I've written them and because I've read so many and because I reported on them. But anybody can start looking through them and then start looking at rating announcements and see whether they think there's some daylight between the two. Um, as an aside, at least the US DOJ is stonewalling on releasing the three compliance commitments that the head of Moody's is supposed to have sent. I know this because a Wall Street Journal reporter told me he had filed a FOIA with the DOJ and that that was sort of shuffled into a very sensitive area that as a reply, um, but you can go around that by going to each of the 20 state signatories and also submitting a FOIA with them. It would be surprising if one or more weren't happy to comply. On the 2018, this fine that the SEC imposed on the internal failures for MBS and also for combo nodes, again, it's not a big fine and the SEC had no choice. Moody's uh, in 2018, so 10 years after the financial crisis, still had incorrect ratings on something like 500 RMBS. It's, it's astonishing to me that they still couldn't even get the right ratings on very deeply, deeply downgraded securities that are, must be reaching the end of their life. Um, the combo note was also an issue. This is an ongoing disaster for the credit rating agencies. Moody's used to dominate in them. The promise of a combo note is nonsensical. As Alberto said, it's a way of placing 
uh, CLO paper with insurance companies. That on itself indicates that the CLO market was not as quite as robust as the CLO practitioners like to pretend, because if it, if it was that robust, CLO issuers wouldn't need to also issue garbage combo notes to place some of their notes. Um, this also shows the rating shopping, which Alberto pointed out. Moody's has stock rating combo notes, and so my understanding is Morningstar has taken it over. Morningstar had, had no experience with CLOs whatsoever, but somehow felt it could rate these deeply unusual combination of two or three or four CLO tranches and this, this promise, which could only exist in structured finance land, which is sort of a nominal promise, like a zero coupon, except there are additional amounts that come in and there are additional SBVs that are set up. Um, this, and along with the repacks into second currencies using a flip clause swap, which I think is also something that the Japanese uh, entities that buy US CLOs do, is just another indication that a lot of the CLO issuance was actually uh, not, not robust, sort of vapors, sort of weak, sort of re resorting to the pre-crisis measure uh, ways of, of issuing paper. Um, Let's see, can you go to the next slide, please, Alberto? Okay, the uh, next one, please. Uh, I, I agree with Alberto, the CLO ratings absolutely need investigation. I don't think they would have held up in even a mild um, recession, let alone the situation that we are going to have going forward. On the second point, the flip clause, how have rating agencies factored flip clause into financial institution ratings? The answer is they don't. They don't bother even measuring derivative contracts in general or any financial institution, let alone look at the risk that the financial institution runs to its own credit rating under a flip clause. Because essentially what a flip clause means, as it did for Lehman, and as it would have meant for AIG or Merrill Lynch or Bear Stearns had they not been uh, rescued, is that the swaps you have with every single structured finance issuer that uh, just before the crisis, every one of these swaps is an asset to you in which you have marked as money good is now worth zero. That is a big, big hole that shows up after the entity, as Lehman did, declares bankruptcy. And what I can see from my work on the Lehman flip clauses is, is that as soon as Lehman declared bankruptcy, i.e. As, as soon as you could demonstrate that its assets were considerably less than its liabilities, it lost another six billion or so in assets. And in, in relative terms, that's about 20% of what its asset base was owing to its exposure to flip clauses. To this date, the rating agencies, but also regulators, unfortunately, don't take this into account at all. And some of my other submissions to the CFTC are to start imposing 100% capital charge on each swap with a flip clause. Um, as far as I know, I, I, as an analyst at Moody's, was the only person, regulator, credit rating agency, independent credit analyst, um, or any other type of person who insisted that any entity that I oversaw that provided the flip clause had to capitalize it. And I began doing this in 2000, and I began doing it simply because I was reading the priority of payments, understood that the derivative provider still had to make its um, obligations in full, um, it, even if it was in distress, and said, wait a minute, if you're going to start losing your capital base because you can't get pay-ins from structured finance entities that otherwise owe you, you, the, de the derivatives provider, need to start um, capitalizing that now. And as an aside, I also rated CDOs and structured notes, and I understood that the flip clause was important for their ratings. And this is why I felt it was important that the swap providers fully capitalized. I had no problem wearing two different hats depending on whether I was doing the analysis of the derivative provider or the derivative user. Um, I think the last point is still worth mentioning why the rating agency still issue nominal ratings for combination securities because it supports their franchise because they get to rate more CLOs if more CLOs are issued, and more CLOs are issued on the margin when combo notes can be rated. Um, next slide, please, Alberto. 
Yeah. With C, I just want to say one thing with S&P. A lot of my critiques, it's easiest for me to critique the Moody's methodology because I understand their format. Um, but if you were to really look at a clown shop, I would say it's S&P. I don't even think their methodologies pretend to be good. Moody's does a lot of very good documentation. Um, it's, it's their protection, I think. The ratings uh, are not warranted. They're too high. But, but Moody's does a, a very good job of, and I think lawyers would particularly appreciate, of tying together its assumptions, its methodologies, explaining what they are. S&P doesn't even bother. Their methodologies are a joke. When I've tried to engage S&P uh, analysts on the flip clause, I'm not even sure they know what it is. And an earlier slide of, of Alberto's mentioned the S&P testimony of the U.S. Senate in 2010. Again, it was another joke. Uh, the, the person testifying didn't seem to understand very basic things about structured finance, and I do think this is intentional. It seems to me the analysts at Fitch and Moody's are slightly savvier. There seems to be some sort of control in both firms as to putting on a good show, although they don't actually deliver, but the S&P doesn't even pretend to put on a good show. It, it, even its methodologies don't make sense, and, and it is a, it, there is a real um, an opportunity just to show how poor the uh, S&P even pretends to go about its job. Um, could you, next slide, please, Alberto. Yeah, and this and also the one after and the one after, you can just sort of scroll through those to get to the last to the to the um, slide with the market share via the graph um, where you show Moody's and S&P and Fitch. So it might be two slides down or three slides down. Yep. And the next one, please. Yes, this one. I mean, this is telling. It might be easy to feel sorry for Moody's here because you see they're the uh, I'm a little bit colorblind, the yellow. Um, uh, mass in the middle because they're really starting to lose market share, except that Moody's makes money hand over fist. If you look at their share price compared to uh, the, the 2010 when it was below 20 and now it's close to 300. So there's no reason to feel sorry for anyone. The, the, the companies themselves are doing exceptionally well. But what is happening in CLOs is what happened in CDOs and RMBS pre-crisis, which is simply whoever gives up the most, whichever credit rating agency makes high ratings easiest to get, uh, gets more business. And so why does this persist? I think it's because the whole financial system wants it to persist. The credit rating age, credit ratings are recognized as a game. Unfortunately, they're a game that almost every player or the user rather thinks they can win. Um, but when we have a whole system of bad data, bad ratings, and they have some very deep um, circulation throughout the decision-making process by policymakers and buyers, even if the buyers are choosing not to use them, it means we're getting worse and worse information to, to make decisions. It, it's akin to having no information on global, on global warming. Uh, it's akin to having no, as we don't in the U.S., any information on gun shootings. Um, it makes all the decision-making that we need to make much, much harder and much, much worse. Um, and I think we just could end on the slide that you have, Al uh, Alberto, showing how uh, pervasive the use of credit, uh, credit ratings are. Um, it's a slide we have clearing houses and um, the CFTC and the SEC and the Fed. It's, it's a couple slides down. This, yeah, this one. I mean, this is just, this is probably the, the right place to end because our rating vulnerables and is the whole system vulnerable because they're looking at the ratings and the rating agencies are trying to figure out what the regulators are going to do. And for instance, in the very specific example of the Fed is using the ratings, but the ratings are based on in part what they think the Fed will do. So it's entirely circular. And then as Alberto has memorialized here, it, the ratings are used in the private sector and in the public sector. Uh, I like number five where he mentions the clearing houses. The, the clearing houses will maintain that they are exempt from a lot of, or immune from a lot of the problems that impacted other parts of finance in the crisis. I, I don't necessarily buy that, I think, but at any rate, they do maintain that and yet has, they have some reliance on the ratings, which is not a good factor. Um, 
And even the CFTC margining rule, as I said, it's best practice in many ways. In fact, it's best practice when it's in the U.S. or when it's a U.S. swap dealer operating in the, or a non-U.S. swap dealer operating in the U.S. But the CFTC is trying to dumb down the rules for U.S. swap dealers uh, operating abroad. And one way it does this, for instance, with respect to the EU, is to say that U.S. swap dealers in the EU can use EU uh, swap rules, which are much more lenient than U.S. swap rules, in part because they're broadly comparable. And one of the reasons they're broadly comparable is that, for instance, sure, the U.S., we, only, we have a very constrained list of possible margin assets that can be posted in margin. Europe's is much wider and includes asset-backed securities. And just think about that again. Do you really want asset-backed securities posted as margin? Um, but then the CFTC says, but that's okay because the European equivalent of the NRSRO regime oversees the credit ratings. And uh, so once again, I, this is a, a basic failure of finance. It's hard to understand why the biggest and what is touted as the most liquid, uh, most amenable to quantitative analysis market in the world ultimately rests on a couple of conflicted firms who know how to make money and they make money by avoiding doing honest evaluation. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Alberto, and thank you very much, everyone, for listening.